this week our Cana New Wine Seminary online course kicks off this fall so you can find out more at the end of this video or visit cana.co for some drunken theology. Now this week is the first of a four-part series that we're gonna do on the earliest church creeds and actually it's one of the topics that we do cover in Cana Seminary. The creeds of the church are vitally important and extremely relevant to the meat and potatoes of your everyday life but Creedal Christianity isn't much valued in the charismatic world because it's associated with dry liturgical churches. Folks seldom realize what an anchor of joy and security it brings to the soul and the fruit and the normality that it bears in our lives to be anchored in the simplicity of the truth. When they were formed, the early church fathers in the early ecumenical councils, and, and that meaning the councils of bishops that represented various streams and geographic regions, they were concerned with helping us sort out the most basic, fundamental understanding of Christology, who Jesus is, and to understand the Trinity. Because these two topics deal most importantly with the nature of who God is, as Jesus the God-man who single-handedly accomplished our salvation, as Trinity, a God in loving relation who longs to bring humanity into the other giving circle of divine love. I mean, so many churches are still confused about who Jesus is. In his hypostatic union, he's both fully God, fully man, and as you know, the hypostatic union is how we describe that Jesus is both divine and human. Now, we're not going to have time to get into the later church council of Chalcedon that really layers the God-man union in Jesus Christ. He's two natures in one person. This is Christianity 101. All Christians give lip service to this, but without a deep revelation that he himself is our bridge, our union with God, we're so prone to fall back upon ourselves, to make relationship happen with our own religious trappings. In the same way, the Holy Trinity is three persons in one essence, not three gods, not three beings, but three persons, one God. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. There are three persons. There is diversity. They are three distinct persons, yet one undivided God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. This is the mystery of the Trinity. Now, the church fathers, man, they layer the person of Christ, and they layer the Trinity in the first creeds that we're going to be addressing, which are the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Like I said, we're not going to get into later creeds like Chalcedon, as important as that one is. But look, without getting this truth into us, we are hopeless at grasping the love and personal intimacy that marks the true nature of God. And this is timeless stuff. You may think, well, that's just the basics. That stuff's been around for almost 2,000 years. Yeah, but most of the church is still totally wrapped up in the same heresies that the fathers were fighting against when they wrote this stuff. And unless you're like a Lutheran or something, you probably don't even know the creeds. Or maybe you've rotely memorized them without grasping the tangible, experiential importance to your own life. I mean, most evangelical American churches... Uh, somebody in there is going to quickly tell you that, of course, uh, I believe who Jesus is from the creeds, but I need to get my life right with God in a practical, personal sense. Well, fellow, listen, you probably don't really grasp who Jesus is from the creeds, or you'd realize that he's already set your life in perfect, personal cohesion with God in his own incarnation, life, death, and resurrection. Man, there is so much glory on the creeds. They're so relevant to us. Of course, some folks may think that they are divisive or too irrelevant or that theological creeds are just too formal and stuffy and stifling. We don't need creeds or theology. We just need Jesus. Okay, well, what you just said there 
is a creed. A creed is just a statement of belief. It is a proclamation of what you hold to be true. And if that is your creed, we don't need theology, we just need Jesus, well, that creed that you just stated is a woefully insufficient one because it fails to state anything about who Christ is or what he's done on our behalf. It's like the person who says, we don't need theology, we just need to live it. Okay, well, that's also a creed, and one that denies the chief article of Christianity, which is justification through faith alone, not by just living it, not by good deeds. So look, the point of good theology is that it actually liberates us. So we're not falling back into the darkness of religion and dead works and a false human focus, but putting us back onto who Jesus is and what he single-handedly accomplished. And so many people these days, they are swept up in the new age or just endless deconstruction of silly doctrines they grew up with in church. And it's imperative that we say something positive about who God is that is concrete and beyond question. I mean, in an age of relativism that leaves us depressed and in a downward spiral of existential confusion, can we acknowledge that God himself is capable of revealing himself in Jesus, that there is a rock-solid foundation that we can lay our head upon and rest at night? Also, let me point out that the creeds are not the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. The truth is a person. And the creeds are oriented to point us most clearly to him. And these are things that have stood the test of time, more than 1,700 years, and the historical winds and waves of doctrine. And like not every single one, uh, specifically the later ones, may be completely infallible in every minute aspect, which is why the Protestant reformers were so clear to say that if something in the creed doesn't seem to jive with scriptures, it's okay to question it. But the whole point of the creeds was to clarify what scripture was telling us about God. It wasn't trying to add to scripture. And they weren't uh, trying either to uh, limit the mystery of God. Their main goal was not to try and draw uh, a, the entire mystery of God out on paper, which is impossible. The main goal of these things was to draw a line against stupid ways of thinking about God, heretical ideas that actually rejected the mystery of Christ in lieu of human ideas and philosophy that clouded the beatific vision. But when we're talking about the two earliest and most important creeds, which we're going to be going through over these weeks, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, well, man, if you disagree with those, I would have to say you're pretty darn deluded because these are virtual litmus tests of orthodoxy. And by that, I mean right ways of thinking about God. These creeds don't put a lid on the mystery. They are a springboard into the eternal mystery into which we've been grafted. Whenever I'm deconstructing some religious idea on a Jesus trip video, or I'm bashing some do-it-yourself human striving, or I'm releasing some Holy Ghost enema of a religious detox, whenever I'm bashing sacred cows, Understand, I am always doing it in light of the creed. I may not agree with every belief of every church father, just as they didn't always agree with one another on things like maybe the doctrine of salvation or whatever, or how sin works. But when it came to the person of God, who he is, on this rock, we stand united, the person of Christ and the all-inclusive love of the Trinity. I don't have time to get into every nuance of every single creed and how they came into formulation. This is already going to be a four-part series. But the later creeds, they did get into more detail. But only because controversies would arise over how to interpret the earlier creeds, like the Nicene Creed uh, and the Apostles' Creed, which is even earlier. And so naysayers who want to bash these early councils and they think that just one particular sect of Christians were imposing their doctrines on other Christians, they often like to point out that the church fathers had arguments and they had politics. Well, guess what? That's exactly true. But that doesn't mean their conclusions were false. Show me one elder board meeting without an argument. My wife and I argue, but that doesn't mean we can't reach an agreeable conclusion. So let's just dig in now. I want to start this week with the Apostles' Creed, okay? In its primitive version, it's believed to have originated uh, as early as the 1st or 2nd century. 
and it, it came about before any early church councils and was possibly even handed down in direct succession from the apostles themselves. It is possible. Okay, so let's just read it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Whew. A few things I want to point out here is that right from the start, prior to any church councils, we have a common recognition of the Trinity. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now next week, We'll break down the creed itself a bit and highlight some of the importance and relevance, again, to our daily lives. And then in part three, we're going to move on to the two versions of the Nicene Creed. So please stay tuned over the next couple weeks. And in the meantime, hey, take a look at some of these events that we have coming up on the calendar where you will have opportunity to party with us in a region near you. And also be a champ and share this video and these events to help us infect the world with some good news because this is pretty important stuff. Bless you guys. I'm often asked my number one recommended resource for diving into the revelation of grace, the finished work of the cross, mystical Christianity, union with God, Trinitarian theology. Well, it's our online course, Cana New Wine Seminary, intoxicating theology with world-class instructors, available at an easy pace right from your own home. Registration is now open for next fall's classes at cana.co. This October, we invite you to take a journey within. Make a pilgrimage with us as we explore the kingdom of God. It's not far away in either time or space. The kingdom of God is all around us, and the kingdom is within. It is right here at hand. Paradise is now. In October, myself, John Crowder, together with Tim Wright leading worship, will travel to four regions of America, Tampa, Florida, Houston, Texas, Billings, Montana, and Redding, California, for our Paradise Now event. Join the adventure with us as we explore the wonder of our mystical union with God. Registration is now open and seating is limited. Visit thenewmystics.com slash tour. Next month, I'm in Germany in September for two back-to-back -back weekend events where you can overdose on glory. Supernatural Joy Unspeakable near Cologne and a mystical school in Hanau. I have one mystical school in America this year in Massachusetts, our only New England event. It's in October. My only other mystical school in America will be in January 2018 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Then we have just one more mystical school on the calendar. It's in France next February. Find every mystical school, conference event, and mission trip online at thenewmystics.com schools. Do you feel a call to missions? Travel with us on a two-nation trip to Kashmir and Nepal as we venture to the Himalayas. Known as a region of conflict, North Indian Kashmir is also labeled the most beautiful place on earth. We'll bring the fire of the gospel. You will heal the sick, carry the glory. It's our only trip now open to applicants, and it's a joint trip with myself, John Crowder, and Matt Spinks. We'll have a grace equipping event in Kashmir, plus a mass crusade where we'll gather thousands in Nepal. We'll also have fun with a night in Kathmandu. We'll go to the lowland jungles of Nepal. You can ride elephants, take a jeep safari, see rhino. We won't make you climb Everest, but you can take the optional hike. The trip is open to all ages. We leave in March 2018, so you have plenty of time to plan, raise funds, sort out the details, but all our trips do fill up. So you do need to get your first deposit in by November 1st to lock in your spot. So take a step of faith, get your application in at thenewmystics.com trek. 
Take the time to pull aside, invest in your relationship, prioritize your marriage. You can book a babysitter and schedule a vacation with us. Come away from the daily stress of life and career and venture to Maui, Hawaii. We have a special getaway in Maui for couples, a marriage retreat designed for marital bliss in paradise. It's John and Lily Crowder, Rick and Melissa Wood, far from a fix-me-up religious self-help program. This marriage retreat is a glorious detox from the fears, insecurities, identity hang-ups, and awkward communication gaps that blind us to the glory of marital joy. Have you ever heard that the honeymoon doesn't last forever? Well, religion tells us that marriage will be difficult, that it requires lots of work, and we should expect the worst. But a gospel perspective should effortlessly revolutionize our expectancies and and supernaturally rekindle a ravenous desire for our spouse. This retreat is designed to deepen your relationship at every level. It's full of fun and candid discussion. We'll cover experiential, real-life topics like sex, money, parenting, and changing the way we think to improve communication skills and intimacy. And yes, you can turn a living hell into a tropical paradise, but this is not just an intervention for troubled marriages or folks with problems. It's all about growth growing in a grace perspective and delving into new realms of love. So come to Maui with us. You have plenty of time to plan. It's February 2018. However, registration will be limited for this event. So we recommend early registration. You can visit thenewmystics.com slash retreat. We're calling all Amish and Mennonites who have been excommunicated, shunned, disfellowshipped, or those who just want to be. Hitch the buggy to Minnesota for this North America Amish Holy Ghost party. Warning, there will be instruments. Tim Wright is going to do the worship. It's fun for the whole family. We are going to party like it's $15.99. Everyone is welcome. Buttons and cell phones are allowed. This November, visit thenewmystics.com slash Amish. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com partners.